All right, well, for those of you who are here to find out if, you know, um, does Google rule, you're in the wrong room. No. Um, um, uh, this, this one really, this presentation is about standardization in classrooms and what PSU we've really done to try to, you know, everyone you've heard that phrase, you know, work smarter, not harder, and we've done all that, and we've tried to find all these opportunities to make our rooms so they're stable, easy to use, and don't require a lot of triage and not a lot of cost in keeping them up. So that's really what my presentation is about, and it's about kind of what I've learned over the years. Um, a few things about this. So basically, you can't, you know, there's that phrase, uh, people who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. So there is definitely going to be a little bit of a history lesson here about how PSU used to build classrooms in the past. What I learned is someone who had to support those rooms. Um, and that's why I moved to being such a complete I am like a broken record. Can we standardize on this? Because if you're going to deviate off of what our standard is, I don't want it. There's going to have to be a compelling reason to get me not to be going with my standard. And that's the drum that I constantly beat to Doug and my fellow coworkers, particularly in this world of emerging technology we're in. Um, so I'm going to be talking about standardizing. You know, what can you standardize in? When and why? When does it matter? When does it not? Um, and then the ongoing challenges that we're facing now in 2011. So a few things. Um, I am sharing PSU's experience and my experience working for them for all the years that I've been there. I want to make it really clear that I am very aware that hindsight is 2020, and believe me, I have tons of respect for the people who came before me and worked with me. I'm not being critical of them. I'm sure at the time what they were doing, there wasn't a mindset on standardization. There was a mindset on specialization. So. It might sound like I'm being critical, but I'm just from, from 2011 perspective, so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I do want to make a disclaimer, too, that this has been our experience of standardizing on certain products and certain classroom designs, that the concepts and maybe some pieces of uh, technology may work really well for you, too, but this is not me trying to sell you on Extron or AMX or Crestron or any products that we have chosen to get rid of or to add, this is simply for us, this is what worked. So I'm not trying to bash any particular product. Um, and my personal style is that if you have a question, by all means, feel free to ask as we're going along. I'm definitely not formal in that sense where, no, wait until I'm all done and my PowerPoint says, you know, in slideshow. Okay. So for a little bit of background, PSU is an urban university. We've got about 30,000 students enrolled. Um, we have tons of, of adjunct faculty. We do not have a lot of people who are there. That's what they do. Kind of, our faculty come and go. They're not there for very long. Um, types and numbers of classrooms. We now have 127 classrooms on campus that are general pool. And that means those are rooms that the university, when they're scheduled with the scheduling office, they get complete control over how those rooms are scheduled. We also have a, a fairly large cachet, I'd say about 60 rooms on campus that are owned by departments. And those rooms we usually at this point are involved when they want technology enhancement in those spaces, but they simply have to pay for the technology enhancement. We're still expected to support that room. Kind of like I was joking the other night, if the room has a projector in it, I'm probably in some way, shape or form supporting it. Um, but those departmental rooms create a challenge. Um, and then I just want to explain a little bit about or organization. People who ask questions about Moodle and desire to learn and those things, those completely fall out of my range of responsibilities or obligations. Um, we keep our plate full with all of this and there's a whole other division called user support services that handles the computers and the networking and all of that kind of stuff. So I can't really answer questions about standardization in terms of that. So my history with PSU and OIT, I started at PSU in 1998 as a computer labs. In the real world, you'd call me an assistant manager. I was a student coordinator. I supervised several labs, had 20 student employees that reported to me, and then I reported to an actual staff person. I think a lot of people started at PSU as student employees and then graduated into staff positions, so I'm not unusual. But I was in the computer labs side of the house long before I did anything in technology. 
and I met Doug, and he was running around showing me their mid-tech classrooms, and we'll, we'll get to those in a minute. So just so you know, kind of my perspectives definitely start about classrooms in 1998 from on forward. So this is our campus. I just kind of want to give people an idea. We are, like I said, an urban university, and pretty much all these buildings, we run around and support technology all the way from the clay building over here to the schools down here, the art building, the, the Unitas building, University Place. The only thing on here, this is a parking structure, but we actually support classes up in this building. And our AV office is in the basement in that building, of course. It used to be that we supported classrooms pretty much in this little strip, and now we really do run around quite a lot. I have to eat a lot of cheese to maintain this shape. You know, there's a lot of running around going on. Um, and again, so 30,000 students, lots of magic faculty, and we're, we're right in the middle of downtown Portland. So even when we're running, we have to make sure we don't get hit by cars or the streetcar. Um, so our classrooms at PSU. So this is a diagram that they actually used to give out to faculty back in 2000. At that point, we had 13 technology-enhanced classrooms. Almost all of them had unique attributes. So we can see they had a, a PC, a Macintosh, an AMX control panel, document camera, microphones. Well, you can look at this. There's almost no rooms that are the same. Cinema 90 and Cinema 92 are the only two rooms that had a PC, a microphone, and a VCR. Do anyone remember that game, Stratego? Anyway, uh, not Stratego. It's uh, anyone anyway, what you put in little poke, the little poker chips down. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, it kind of reminds you, like, no one is going to win this game because no one has, like, an elaborate tic-tac-toe. Hoffman Hall down here almost gets it, but, oh, no DVD player in Hoffman Hall. Now, I guess my question for all of you is, if you were faculty and you were given this sheet, and you don't have any control over what room you're scheduled in, is this going to make you happy? I mean, if you need a document camera for your teaching, you go, well, I better not end up in the cinemas, I better not end up in Newburgh or 446, this is not a good way to help get faculty to start adopting technology because it's a complete gamble whether they're going to end up in a room that has that technology in it. So this is, and again, I think back then, what they were trying to do is they were trying to make rooms that specialized in certain things. And I'm sure that seemed like a neat idea, maybe they were exploring. Um, but I can see why as a faculty member I would find this kind of configuration where almost every single room was different in some way would be extremely frustrating. So we jump ahead four years and what we've got now is we've got this new creation called the mid-tech that I'm going to go over the levels in a minute. We've created a whole bunch of those. We've got high techs that fall into categories levels two, three, and four and then we've got departmental classrooms. Now the question on this is they, I actually used to hear this on the phone. Okay, the room you're teaching in is a level three. Okay, if you're telling a faculty member that, what is it? A faculty member, oh, I'm, I'm in a level three. What exactly does that mean, right? It's, it's this kind of useless nomenclature we had. But this was an opportunity to try to expand technology all across campus. So we had 31 mid-techs, 16 high-techs of those. Some were level twos, 10 were level threes, four were level fours, and then we had those departmentals. So this is the mid-tech. The mid-tech, which I know has been presented at Northwest Met in years past, this was our in-house solution to be able to expand technology across campus in a lot of rooms. And basically what it was was it was a plate on the wall that had a microchip and processing behind it that when you would plug in a VGA cable here, that would send out a signal, or you'd plug in your phono here, the chip would recognize that you've sent out a video signal and it would tell the projector to turn on and it would tell the amplifier to turn on so you could plug everything in and you'd get projector and sound out of the room. And this was just like, you know, an input like you would see nowadays on a podium. So again, we had 30 plus of these on campus. I spent all my time running around training faculty on these. Level twos were mostly, so this is an Extron System 7. I don't, how many of you are familiar with System 7s? Okay, a couple of you, a couple of you. So on a system seven, you've got your sources over here. You've got your available inputs over here, not unlike the mid-tech panel. That little button right there says display power, and you would press that. You have to press and hold it and hold it and then release for it to turn on the projector. If you just press and release, it's not going to do anything. 
And this little thing there says, press and release when it's time to let it go. So these were in a lot of rooms. Some rooms had document cameras, some not. This is a level three, a level three classroom. Often had a document camera, but not always. You had the System 7 in the rack there. There's the microphone. But you also had an AMX touch panel. So for these rooms, the confusion is a faculty's walking in the classroom. They see the same rack they've seen in all the other rooms. But now they've got this touch panel in the room. And faculty would look at me and go, why do I need to use this if I've got the button right there that I have in the other dozen rooms that I press? And how come I, if I press that here, why is that bad? Because the projector's not turning on. So this added glitz, but it didn't add functionality. And it, it a, added a lot of confusion. When I would go train faculty in these types of rooms, it took twice as long as rooms that didn't have AMX panels. L last level of classroom, the level four, multi-image system, touch panel, AMX. This, some of these rooms had system sevens. This room does not have a system seven in it. The AMX is right down there. For, as you all know, I'm sure for multi-image rooms, you've got to have some kind of touch panel for them to control their sources. So what were the issues? So for this system, how do you turn it on? You plug it in, and then the projector turns itself on by the chip. The audio turns on. How do you turn on this room? You press the display button. In an AMX room, you turn it on there. Yeah, so yeah, you have to t tap your fingers on to wake it up. Some faculty are like, where's the on button? Um, so the problems with these is they all operated very differently from one another. Faculty in these rooms had a whole different type of operation they had to do to get the system to work than from these and these. These seemed to have the least problems. And what I noticed, because I'm the one who ran around and trained all the faculty, they seemed to get buttons. Buttons, you push it, something happens, I get it. This seemed the least problematic of every option we had. You've got the volume control right there. Again, I've got faculty or adjuncts. Some were 18, some were 80. Touch panels made some of them nervous. Um, the other issue that I haven't talked about is projectors. We had all of these projectors in our rooms. We had NEC VT540s, 1040s, 1055s, 1060s, a whole slew of Hitachis. Do all those projectors have the same throw? Like, if I, if I put a NEC VT540 right here, the image is going to be like this. But if I put an Hitachi 880 in there, the, the image might be like that. What kind of problems is that causing for me? If I need to swap out that NEC with another projector, what are my choices? The mount's been installed by facilities. There's $2,000 if I want them to move that mount and that power, right? So again, at the time, I'm sure what they were thinking was, let's get the best projector we can this July, now the new fiscal started, and they'd go buy you know, a dozen projectors, and this is what they would do. We also had Proximas and Sonys, but I'm not even going to touch those. So a huge waste of our time was trying to manage the inventory of all the lamps. All those different projectors all had different lamps. None of them were interchangeable. I had to make sure I had a certain number in stock all the time. It added expense. They're collecting dust, all kinds of problems. Again. Projector mounts were different distances. A projector would go out, go bad. The brightnesses would be different. We had faculty calling us saying, I think the projector in this room is going bad. It actually wasn't. It's just that it was an NEC VT540 compared to an Hitachi 880. And I couldn't put an Hitachi 880 in that room because it had a whole different communication that I had to do and had a whole different throw. So it creates all kinds of problems for upgrading and getting these rooms working. So standardizing. So what should you standardize on? When and when doesn't it matter? And why standardize on anything? So for control systems, the question is, is it scalable? Is there a version that's going to work in all situations for all clients? And also, when you're dealing with departments, is it going to be something they can afford? And now we were just talking about that beforehand, is expenses always a challenge? And how's that going to work? The other thing, if you're going to standardize on something, it's got to be something that's a good product. You can't just. That sounds obvious, but sometimes we would try to standardize on something and then it'd break and we'd have problems. We'd go, oh, pause, let's wait, let's see where we're at on this. Let's not buy 30 of these and then find out that they're not the best. 
sometimes you would think it's easy to standardize if you just stick to the same brand. Oh, I'll just buy all Panasonic projectors, right? And they're all going to be the same. No. And an easy, really good example of this is with Extron systems. And I'm going to go into that here in a minute. So this is the Extron 5IP. This is what we're using these days. Now, it looks an awful lot like those System 7s I just showed you in those level two classrooms, right? But here's the challenge. In an Extron System 7 room, you press and you hold and you wait and you wait and you release. Okay, and then the projector's gonna turn on. In this room, click, push, projector comes on. So you end up with about 20 of these on campus and another 20 of these on campus. Guess what's happening? Faculty in these rooms are like, the projector's not turning on. I'm having all kinds of issues. That little light's blinking. So operationally, a System 5 IP and a System 7 do not operate the same way on a key thing, getting the projector on, which is the number one thing that makes faculty nervous. Projector's not coming in, and that's when we end up running all over campus, and my budget for buying cheese to keep this shape goes up and up and up through the roof. So again, on, on projectors, if you're not going to standardize on a single projector because of size of room or whatever, at least try to standardize in a way that if you're buying that projector, like how many people have the Panasonic 300s now? A few of you. One of the things that's nice about these is they have this huge range of throw, and they've got these little joysticks so you can actually move things around. But the challenge is when we're installing these, let's not push the projector to its ultimate limit. Let's say, well, just because the pipe could be back 17 feet, do you really want to put it back 17 feet? If the range there is 13 to 17 feet, let's look at what other projectors are doing. And if the average range is 15 feet, let's put it at 15 feet. That way, if we need to swap it at some point with something different, we're not going to have this issue where this projector we swap in is going to either overfill or underfill the screen. We had one situation I had to learn really painfully. Doug was on a cruise ship in Alaska. We bought all of these projectors. And yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. Doug was on a cruise ship with Murray in Alaska. I was on campus. We had our new chief information officer, Sharon Blanton, who's extremely on the ball, and you don't mess with her. And we were building these rooms called the Kramer Hall stack, all these rooms, 271, 371, 171. And we took out all these old NEC MT1055 projectors. Very dim projectors, but they had a great throw. You could be all the way in the back of the room and you still get a nice clean image that would not overfill. We bought a projector that had a completely different throw. We thought we were okay, we weren't. Those projected images were shooting from the top of the ceiling to the floor, which meant that any student sitting in the rows was gonna have their, it was gonna look like Mystery Science Theater 3000, for those of you who know. Is that a good way for teachers to teach? No. So we had to scramble and we had to order Hitachi 1250s for that situation. But the other debate was, do we spend $1,500 to have facilities move that pipe forward? So we're trying to prevent that now, even though this projector is fantastic, just because it's got that great throw, let's not assume the next projector is going to be able to do that great thing like the NEC 1055s did. Um, the other thing is can you standardize and should you standardize on mounts? I would say absolutely. This is the mount that we use. It's a BMS Landlock 2. The reason I love these is because no matter what projector you buy, these are going to work. How many of you buy chief plates? We used to buy chief plates and the problem was there's like a different chief plate for every projector, or there's like one that'll work for three or four. And the problem is they each have these unique odd shapes. They're actually kind of artistic in the way they lock on. I can't tell you how many times in the last, last many years before we went to BMS mounts where we wouldn't have the correct, the part number would get ordered wrong, and all of a sudden we would end up with a chief plate that we couldn't mount to our projector and it wouldn't work. And we'd had some of these BMS mounts at some of our oldest rooms. And basically, it's just this big plate that slides in. It's got these little slits in it. So any projector can go on there, and it's secured. And this is a little lock that you have on your key. And these actually allow you to adjust the pitch and yar of the projector. So you can put this in any room, and it doesn't matter what projector you buy, because the bottom right in here is perforated. You can move with, with the plates any projector you want. And I would be able to swap in projectors in the four rooms that had those. And I was looking at our install technician, Gordon, and talking to Doug and going, why didn't we just keep buying those for everywhere? Because we've had at least a dozen instances where we've got a projector we need to install and, oh, we don't have the corresponding mount. We don't have the right chief plate for that and we're out of luck. These have made our rooms a lot more secure. Someone just tried to break into the library over Christmas break 
and they actually take a crowbar to it and they destroy the projector in the attempt to get the projector down. That person's not gonna try again because they realize they can't get the projector down. These are just too hard. And yet, if I need to swap this projector, it's three minutes because I stick the key in there and it slides out on this whole tray and I'm done like that. It's so easy. So standardizing on projector mounts has, I love this. This is my favorite thing, frankly, that we've standardized on. And no matter what projectors do in the future, the mounts we've got in now will work. Document cameras. This has been the hardest thing for us to standardize on. How, how have you standardized on document cameras? If, have you, do you have them in your rooms altogether? Anything? The, yeah, the, the, the thing that I found with document cameras is that that technology has, has evolved so fast and they used to be just kind of these big, cumbersome behemoths. And now they've got these little preview windows and some of them have XGA and DVI and all these fancy features. Faculty love them, but there's so many varieties. You know, and the Elmos make some great ones. We finally, a year ago, decided to standardize on the Aver Media. And the reason we did that is because this one actually has a little function on here of recording and streaming. And the button couldn't be any easier. It looks like a little camcorder. Looks like what Erica's got back there. You push the button and it starts recording. And you press another button and it stops. So we felt of all of them, this one had, a real, had really nice features. It was intuitive enough to use. And if you follow the buttons, it's not too bad. I would say if you spoke to Brian, who now does, has students do a lot of the training, they would tell you probably the biggest challenge we still have on campus is when people are in a classroom and they're used to this Elmo over here and they have to go to a room like this. But once they've learned this, they get it because they use them every day. It's not a product they use it one week and then don't use it for three weeks. Our faculty use the document cameras every single day. It's the, when I train them, this is the product they always go, cool. It's the one thing that, you know, they don't, you know, they've got a DVD and VCR at home. Those things aren't exciting. They've got a computer. The document camera is the item that has saved them from having to make transparencies. It's made their lives easier. The geologists love them. The art historians love them. So these get used all the time. So these have not, they've been a hard thing to standardize on, but faculty have seemed to adopt them pretty easily. And also the AV or meters are also pretty cheap too. DVD VCR combo players, again, the thing that I've noticed with these when we're standardizing is making sure the remotes are pretty much the same. We had an incident a couple years ago with Panasonic where we bought a whole bunch of Panasonics and then we bought a whole bunch more and the model number had changed. And you know, if the Panasonic DVD VCR combo unit is like a Panasonic 1250, the remote would be a E1978G. It didn't tell you what remote went with our projector and so we had a whole bunch of Panasonic combo units and then when the next batch came in, the remote looked just the same, but it would not operate the combo unit. So we'd be installing these, faculty member would call up and go, oh, I think my remote is dead, I can't queue up to my DVD to where I need to. I think the batteries are dead, we'd go in and change the batteries, no problem. We had to do all this resorting of our remotes and testing them. So, if you're gonna to try to, to purchase these, the big key is, is, again, this is something faculty is touching, and that's what I've found. It's super important from a, from a support standpoint to standardize on and make sure the buttons stay the same. Things like top menu and main, men, main, main menu, particularly now that we're starting to get into the Blu-ray world, tends to confuse faculty. So I tend to actually check with them on DVD VCRs. So how many of you have moved to 16 by 10 screens? Just keys? Yeah. I've, I'm actually surprised there haven't been more problems with this on our campus. Um, I think as we slowly evolve, faculty are used to it and their PowerPoint seem to adapt. I think I've been hearing people talk about electric screens a lot. Really at our campus, the only time we put in an electric screen is if the room is large enough, that the screen is large enough that pulling it down would be a problem. And again, we've standardized on daylight CSRs, control, controlled return screens, that when they, they go up, they don't go like the old cartoons with blinds because we found actually the fabric and the material would come out of the casing and the CSR is faculty like, they're not noisy and they're strong and durable. So that's what we've standardized for those. Speakers, you know, this is one of those things, again, faculty's not touching these. So they really couldn't care less. They, you know, if it's, if it's a room like this, we're gonna put in JBL control 25s, and if we had a cloud ceiling, we'd put in um, TOA speakers. Um, 
our important thing to do is we standardize on, based on the size of the room, how many of those we install or what size. But faculty, that's, that's not an important thing to standardize on for us. Microphones. How many people in here are using Sennheisers? Nobody? Wow. Anyone? Yeah. Anyone using Revo Labs? No? Okay. Revo Labs operate very differently. You know, Sennheiser is actually what I've got on right now. Sorry, I probably just made it scratch and pop. Um, um, that's the Sennheisers over here. And the Revo Labs, you've got this little thing that looks, you know, like a little stick, and you just attach this to yourself, and it comes with a lanyard. And this is the charging base. And when you leave the room, it lets you beep and lets you know you've left, you're too far away from this, which is nice, because I'm the guy that has to call and email faculty and go, okay, who took the microphone out of School of Business Room 190? Come on. I'd have I'd find that faculty going, that wasn't me this time, and they'd be all. So the nice thing about the Revo Labs has been that they beep at faculty if they get so engaged in the conversation with a student as they leave the room, they forget to take off the mic. I'm surprised I haven't seen more challenges with faculty with the transition from the Sennheisers to the Revo Labs. We've had some technical issues with audio dropout that actually Erica and her team have noticed over in Video Production Services. So we have found if we're going to do an event like this where we need to record it, we're sticking with Sennheisers for now. But in most other applications, we've been moving to the Revo Labs, and we're going to have to keep on checking on what this audio dropout issue is. We've talked to Revo Lab about it, and they think it's the way the wiring is. So this is one where we're still in the investigation stage. Mom, have you had issues with the Revo Lab batteries? No. Yeah, we haven't had any issues with, with the batteries at all yet. Um, we haven't had to replace any yet, and again, charging in their stations. Um, we do put them in our large lecture rooms and also in our small lecture rooms. And in the small rooms, I would say they get used maybe a couple hours a day. In the large rooms, they're probably on four or five hours a day. But so far, BA190, right, this is one of our, our largest lecture rooms, I haven't, we haven't had any problems at all with battery life. So if that comes up, we're definitely going to want to investigate it. I'll be curious to, I'm probably going to be Googling that when I get back to work to see if, because if that's a problem and they don't have a resolution for it, we may need to think about that before we move forward with getting more of those. But what have, what have you heard? Yeah. They have a lifetime warranty. Yeah. They charge? Yeah, that's, that's what I huh. Okay, we haven't gotten to that point with those yet. We've had, we've had them in we've been using them now about a year and a half. I'll, I'll, so uh, I'll Yeah. Okay. Is it price Um they're pretty comparable. Yeah, they're within like $100, $150 of each other. And the Revo Labs, to go back to that, we've been buying, oops, we've been going back to the twin pair. So we actually have two at any given point in time. We will charge them both and then leave one inside the podium. Um, and that way, if one does accidentally leave the room, we've got the backup right there. So. Not with Revo Labs at all. Now with the Sennheisers, what we've done with those is I install those on an as-needed basis. And with those, I have to go make sure the frequencies are all different. And I'll actually have an Excel sheet that I record what the frequency is for every Sennheiser installed in every room. And if I'm going to put a Sennheiser in the Academic Student Rec Center room 215, I'm going to make sure the 220, the room right next door, is not on the same frequency. But you know, we're so spread out across campus that there's not too many opportunities for interference. In the Revo Labs, there's, there's none of that because they're on a completely different system. So after bashing all those things, what are the lessons we've learned? When I've worked with faculty, what I've noticed is they calm down when they come into a room and they see one of these. Now, this is not me trying to pitch you on a class tech product, but I ran down to Clay, which is one of our farthest classrooms to support faculty. I was in the room waiting for her to show up. She walks in. She looks at this and she goes, oh. I know what that is. I, I, I'm, I'm good. You can go. I'm like, OK, job done. So it's actually the, the look, as much as the equipment in here has really psychologically calmed our faculty down a lot. Again, I was the guy that used to train everyone. I ran around all day long. 
we have a lot more classrooms that are technology enhanced now than we did in 2004. And faculty are so used to this configuration now, they don't freak out. And again, we've got these push buttons. There's not a touch panel up here as much as class tech would love us to buy a touch panel. There's no touch panel up here. It adds expense, doesn't add functionality for us. We've even made it so all of our class techs have the exact same button configuration. So we don't change the room. So you're not going to find the PC source down there. We've, we've configured these so they all operate exactly the same. So regardless of what room the faculty's in, regardless of what projector's on the ceiling, this is the configuration of the System 5 IP. And so faculty can start even using these without at some point even needing to look down. It just becomes like getting used to your keyboard. You, don't, you know that the, the farthest button to the right is the one for your laptop input, and then they, there they go. So here's that old Omdean 218 room I showed you earlier that has the VMX panel right here. So what I started doing is I said, you know what? AMX panels in single source, single image rooms are adding expense. They cause faculty anxiety to go up. They're a derivation from just a simple System 5 IP. And they cause confusion. So we're going to get rid of all the AMX panels except in multi-image rooms. So that's what, that was my job. I went around and was like, unless we need it, it's going away. So that's on Dean before. That's on Dean 218 after. Again, from the front side, on Dean 218. And you can see faculty don't want to sit behind these big desks, at least not at my university. On Dean 218 after. Again, a lot less cumbersome. The technology is right there. This is ADA compliant. We don't have to have long, painful meetings with the ergonomics guy on campus because, oh, you know, someone with a wheelchair can't get behind there. That, this does not impede the faculty member moving around and working and using their system where that did. So you look at our classrooms now. These are all of our high-tech classrooms at this point. We have one lowly general pool room that we did not even know was general pool. We were told two weeks into the term, is there any technology in Newberger 47? No. Did you know that's General Pool? No. Oh, well, we just found out too. I'm like, OK, well, we're not going to install technology now. The class term has started. But we only have three AMX controlled systems left on campus. Those are our large lecture halls that have multi-image, multi-source solutions. We only have seven system sevens left, and those are all slated to go away in July. And then we have 116 classrooms that are on the 5IP standard, and they're all configured the way I just showed you on that wiring. Faculty training, in spite of having all these rooms now be high tech, uh, is down. When I talked to Brian about our training sessions, he's like, yeah, they're way down. Let me just get this back up. So what we've done is we've decided to standardize based on the size of the room. We know what the seating cap is. We know exactly what we're going to put in. So if it's up to 45 seats, we put all those items in up there. I used to run around and install and uninstall document cameras all the time. It's like, you know what? This is a really poor use of my time. Let's just get them in every single room. It's the number one thing the faculty complain about when it's not in the room. We have to start working smarter, not harder. They'll, buy, they'll give us money for technology, but not for staffing. Our staffing numbers have not gone up. We actually used to have two AV managers. We had a day shift and a night shift. Now we just have the AV manager, which is Mr. Brian T. Myers. Um, so our staffing numbers have gone down, but our need to run to all these rooms has gone down because we've standardized in all these things. If a room gets bigger, we might up the projector from an FW300 to something else. But everything else stays the same. And the only thing is we will add a PA system for audio enhancement for the faculty member teaching in the space. And then for 90 plus seats, we will customize those rooms. If there's going to be the option to send dual images at the same time, we will have a touch panel in there. Currently, those are AMX panels. I'm looking to move those to Extron as, as well. Any questions about that? So really, our whole campus is like the same, the same, the same now. So we were talking about departments. What I tell departments is by having them standardize on something that we already have in our classrooms, their faculty can go from teaching in a geology room to one of our other rooms, and they're going to have the exact same experience. They're not going to have this trauma over a mid-tech panel that takes the control away from you. It has to get a video signal to turn on. 
versus a room where you push a button. So I always tell them, you know what, help me help you. If you buy a projector that we have in our classrooms, I'm going to have that lamp in stock. So when it blows out, I can replace it for you. You're not going to have to stockpile those yourselves. By standardizing on this Panasonic here, we've reduced the number of lamps you have to keep on campus at any one time. I still have some lamps from NEC VT540 sitting back there collecting dust. That was money wasted that we're never going to get back because we had too many varieties of projectors on campus. What I've also found is that with some Panasonics, even though they'll have four different models of a projector, they'll all use the exact same type of lamp, so I only have to keep three of those in stock, and they're getting used. We're, we've, I've not got money sitting on a shelf. It just makes me annoyed and upset. So working with departments, if you can find a scalable version of your solution. Our conferencing and events don't have a lot of money, and frankly, it wouldn't make sense to put a podium in all those rooms. This is one of their typical rooms. We've used an extra on MLC 104. This should look familiar. So if you go to this, remember the System 7 to System 5 IP? One you had to press and hold, the other one not. With these, these buttons operate exactly the same as those buttons. A faculty member can go from teaching in a general pool room with these to teaching in a room with one of these, and they're not going to, they're going to understand how to use it. And our, again, our training for these is way down. The only people we're training on these are outside clients. And these are very cheap. So for a department, they're, they're very cost effective. In our computer labs, which Monica is our computer classrooms and labs manager, uh, a couple years ago, we had an opportunity to enhance 10 rooms for a department. And this is the solution we went with, which is a Pixie control system. They're perfectly fine. They're great. Again, this doesn't operate anything like an Extron. We had an opportunity this last summer to re-enhance some rooms. We're now using Extron plates in those. And the great thing about that is we will have faculty who are teaching in a computer lab who one day out of the term are going to want to be able to show a movie. Now they can because they've got this plate. A couple hundred dollars more than that Pixie, but a lot more functionality. And the other great thing about this being an Extron product is we can put it on our GVE. Anyone know what GVE is here? Global Viewer Enterprise. We're able to remotely monitor these rooms the same way we do all of our other rooms and check the status which helps us be efficient with our staffing. Because we'll know if that projector in this, if a room has this in it, we know if that projector's been disconnected or had a power issue or, or its lamp is near the end of its life. But in a room with a pixie, we have no idea. In a pixie room, someone can leave the projector on. They can't leave a projector on in an Extron room. At midnight, we set a timer to tell these projectors to turn off. So we've really gone extremely standardized and scaled. And I don't know why I'm losing image. Oh. So ongoing issues. The challenge is now, frankly, are that we've got these document cameras to deal with. And now that we've got 126 rooms, ongoing updates are going to be what can we afford to do? And they're probably going to be in waves. We're probably going to beta test them with our faculty. I don't know if any of you, what kind of relationships do you have with faculty? I have several faculty that, you know those birds they put down in the mines to test when there's a gas leak? Canary. I have several faculty that I use as canaries. I will get them to try something out. I'll get them to try out a projector. I'll have a, I have a favorite art historian that if the colors are off at all, she'll let me know. If the audio doesn't sound good, she lets me know. I get faculty like that to help me beta test my technology. If they don't like it, I know I need to keep on investigating it. If they love it, then I'm like, you know what, if I've got her happy, then everyone else is going to be okay too. But these are the challenges. She doesn't have any problems. Professor Taylor doesn't have any problems with that change to document cameras. So we've been okay with those. Other challenges coming up. How, how many of you have been inundated with, with vendors requesting to show you short throw projectors? It seems like a new short throw projector comes out about once a month. We've tried five on campus. I have finally had to start having a conversation with Doug and with Jeff and go, we're going to have to standardize at this point. We can't keep, we've got four different short throws on campus already. I'm already seeing a lamp inventory drama coming up. Let's stop. Let's wait six months. We're going to pick one and that's the only one we're going to buy for the next two years. So these are the challenges that we have coming up. Um, and now we have to move to new high def standard in our podiums too. I'm looking for an opportunity to get an Extron solution for that that we can incorporate into our System 5 IPs, but we'll see. 
And then, of course, Apple, every time you think you've got every adapter they've got, they make a new one. Um, so those are the things we're all struggling with, the same thing with all the kinds of outputs that are available now. We, we have situations where someone will bring an iPad in and they need to display up in our ballroom. It's an all hands on deck panic. So really, that's, that's the gist of my pretty common sense approach to standardization. Do you have any questions for me about any of this or anything we've done? Yes? I've gone one step further on standardization and standardized our board meetings. Ooh. And uh, our president initially did not want, you know, a fancy boardroom controller and that. I said, fine, you'll get exactly what's in the classroom. Yeah. And he happened to have gone into a classroom. Highly unusual for him. He felt one of those interactive presidents. Yeah. And yet he was very patient. He walked through and said, I know how to do this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I found too. I think in our room, <coughs> pardon me, we've done a lot of media link controllers on those. And right now we have a challenge with geology where they are using electron microscopes. And they have four workstations that they want any one person using a workstation to be able to send a signal to the projector at that moment. And they want to be able to do it in high def and control it from their desk. So that's a situation where we're looking at how can we standardize what they're doing so it looks enough like what they do in the other rooms on campus, but also meets their needs in the room. So the back end of that won't be what our standard is, but we hope the front, that the operational controls are going to be standardized. You can't get removed from the MLP that look identical to the others. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we've done in, in some, we, we have a theater room where it's used both as a classroom and as a theatrical space. So we put an MLC at the front of the room, but it also operates and controls the system in the back of the room. So when they're doing a theatrical production and they're actually using the AV and the project, projector and all of that, they can control it from the back room. But a faculty who lectures in there every Tuesday and Thursday can still plug into the front of the room and use it. And because it's an MLC, they go, oh, I know what this is. I know how this works. Yeah, and even though it's it, on the back end, it's, it's off standard. But to the teacher, it's on. Yeah, exactly. All right, everyone. Well, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, on iCast, uh, do you have adapters and whatnot? Yeah, we, we've been buying adapters as they come available. I think the, the challenge we're having is, again, just keeping up with them. And sometimes, you know, like the iPad 2 comes out, and we're like, oh, man. And then we're all like, where's the adapter? Where's the monitor? Are we ready for this? Let's, who's, running, who's running to the Apple store? You know, we're, who's got the OIT credit card? And that's, that's usually what we end up doing. And it's, it's a frustration. I mean, you got to love Apple for being innovative. But all of these outputs, they, they, they're, I mean, they're, they're keeping us running to the store. So. Um, do you purchase iPads? Yes. Uh, OIT has purchased iPads. The user support services side of the house has purchased some. We have not on our side of the house for AV. Our, yeah, our AV office at this point has pretty much turned into, they've become the help desk that runs to the rooms that does the initial triage for the rooms. But see, their staffing numbers haven't changed. Even though we've got 100 more high techs than we did five years ago, they don't have any more student staff than they did back then. But they've become basically a laptop checkout. And even with that, it's greatly gone down. We've simply changed the role from here's your VCR, here's your mid-tech cable kit to Oh, I'll be right there. And then they run to the campus, then I'm buying them cheese, too. So. What staff do you have to support those hundred and other classrooms? Well, for our whole unit, I've got myself. Monica manages the computer labs and classrooms. And she's got about 70 student employees working for her. We've got a 24-hour lab. We've got the three mega labs. We've got all those computer classrooms. In the AV office itself, we've got Brian Myers, who's the manager, and then all student staff. And we've got three student workers on at any given point in time. One of them is dedicated to all the events going on. They're located in our student union, and that building has all the events going on, so they're constantly running upstairs to work with clients who have never seen this technology before, and they just want to come in and use it and make it work. So we've really got two who are supporting all the classrooms. Do you charge for uh, conferences with clients? Yeah, and that's the, the classroom audiovisual services event team definitely charges for that, and they set up whether they charge a setup fee or they charge a support fee, which is like $25 an hour. And then we pay those student employees differently if they're supporting an event than if they're supporting a classroom because 
they probably have to look nicer, it's more high stress. You know, if you've got the president of the university there and his PowerPoint does what mine didn't hear, he's like, all right, we're, you know. So, you know, the stress, we pay them basically for the stress. We pay them 12, 15 hour as opposed to 8, 15 hour basically for that process. Do you work study students or are they all paid? We use a combination. We don't limit ourselves to work study students. We have found that if we hire based on skill sets rather than on whether they were get, got, got a grant for work study or not, that we end up with the best folks in our unit. I collaborate with the student affairs office with several other hires on campus because I do supervise about 120 student workers. I've worked with them on the SOP for the entire campus and what I hear the other managers with large student employee groups is that some of them, their work study students are terrible. And, and, and that, that I'm sure half of that has to be the way they're being managed. But also, um, I just want to make sure that we hire the best possible candidate. If they're work study, that's a bonus. But we don't limit ourselves to that. And we never want to get in a situation where we do all this massive interviewing the first week of September, where we would have to double that because we had to do all this aggressive work to get all work study students. Where right now it's open to everyone. We get people who want to be videographers for their careers. We've got people working with Erica um, and Brian Grant who they want to be filmmakers. Well, that's someone we want to hire. I don't care whether they've got work study or not. So it, it kind of depends on the nature of it. We love work study and I haven't had, had any personal issues. In fact, one of our all-time favorite employees, Marco, is a work study student. So I'm not bashing work study. Just I find it from a hiring perspective it's a challenge to get 117 employees and have and make an expectation they'll be work study. So. Can you say something about the cost of like say the class size for you, how much that unit costs and then how much can you then save uh, for the standard actually? Yeah, for, for the class tech podium, though <coughs> sorry, those run for us, they're about $7,000 for the whole kit, where an MLC, one of those mid, mid link controllers, you're talking about you know, a few hundred dollars. So what we've done with the Class Tech Podium is the old furniture we used to buy was all custom made by a group called Star Motion. They all designed them for instructional design. And again, faculty would walk in and go, I can't even find the VCR. It's like, here's my control system. VCR is back over here. Um, so for us, the Class Tech Podium, I, I can't really tell you how much cost savings goes into those. It's simply the cost savings from not needing faculty to constantly render rooms. Because even if the technology in the podium was the same, if it's in a completely different piece of furniture, faculty get anxious and nervous. So yeah, those podiums are about $7,000. And then the MLCs are you know, about $400. Um, but the cost savings is in not having more staff. Because they will give us like COPS funds and things like that, or tech fee allocation to pay for equipment, but we won't, we can't pay for staff with that. So, so that's how do you, um, how, do, how do you figure out a way to show that, that it's been saving you? Staff? Well, yeah, no, it's, well, it's, it saves us in, for example, lamps, because just the lamps we keep in stock now has gone way down. I only need to buy six Panasonic 300 lamps for all the projectors we have on campus. And then these particular projectors last, the lamps last you know, 4,000 hours. And so they're lasting us a year, year and a half. Um, so the savings isn't in the podium. The other savings is in that Extron 5 IP because we've got them on Global Viewer. We know preemptively when a lamp is gonna go out because we get the warning lights. So we don't have that drama of having a teacher halfway through Citizen Kane and long before you know, they throw the sled in the fire. Sorry, did I ruin that for anybody? The projector bulb burns out and then the class doesn't know so what rows about it. Have you kept some data from like previous year? Is there data from previous uh, year? Part of the reason it's difficult is because at the same time that we become more efficient and save money that way, we triple the number of rooms. Yeah. So it's like this weird, it's almost like happened at the same time. So I don't, I don't think we have like an exact comparison. Yeah. The nice thing about using GVE is that we're actually going to be able to know what, what equipment they're using in the rooms too. And again, the prices of things have changed too. I mean, I can see way back in circa 2000 why every room didn't have a DVD player. I mean, you can imagine now you'd think someone's crazy, oh, those are 50 bucks, why don't you have them in every single room? 
So the cost savings has been there. The cost savings has been in document cameras. Document cameras, you can still buy a document camera for, 7, 000, for several thousand dollars, but by going to the Aver, Aver Medias at about 650, we're saving that money there. So, and then again, and not buying, the ex, not buying the AMX panels, not having to have someone program an AMX panel. And I'm like, you know what, it's a single source room. Why do we need all these buttons? It just, faculty walk in, they're like, and it just makes them nervous that the technology may or may not, it makes them feel like it's out of their control where a button does not. So, you, you said something else? Yeah. Right. With just student labor, right. As opposed to having, you know, uh, yeah. you know, facilities come in, or to even have to have, um, you know, a programmer like to hire out a programmer right. come in to change something. So if we right. need to, if something dies and we need to swap that room right away and get it online, we can bring another one in. Well, and again, when we had problems with AMX systems, I don't know how, how many of you are from the Portland area, we hire Mike Neely, who's fantastic with AMX systems, but he charges what he's worth. That's extra expense for having those AMX systems. And we, used to, I mean, we had 13 AMX systems, and I'm just like, why is this in this room? Faculty aren't going, oh goody, an AMX panel, when they're going, please just give me more of those buttons. I had problems with them connecting things from the AMX panel to the system seven input because they didn't understand why they couldn't use one over the other. So there's those, and even the podium, just to bring back to that, we actually have a whole building that there was no way telecom could get in there. So we have eight wireless podiums that are literally just on wheels. The only thing they're plugged into is power. And in a year when that building goes away and we throw a big party to build it here, we're just gonna wheel those podiums back to campus and use them in a completely different room. So if rooms go offline or online, we can take those podiums, disconnect them, and wheel them out. Where resident technology is before with those giant tables was just a bear. It's much, you're, we're much better off with these podiums that we can wheel around. And rooms change from being departmentally controlled to not, and sometimes back and forth. We lost classrooms in one building, Shattuck Hall. The fine performing arts department, in particular architecture, tried to make a, a, a pitch to take over that entire floor that had eight general pool classrooms in it. They got half. Well, we just had to go in, disconnect our podiums and wheel them out, and now those podiums are in Newburger Hall and other rooms that we had yet to enhance. So we didn't have to pay a lot of money to get those relocated. It was an afternoon. So, yep. Yeah. Um, do you charge half the image? We charge departments. So if a department comes to us and says, like geology is right now with that one room, we will charge them our labor and our parts and I was talking a little bit earlier about, you know, sometimes we'll hire out. If we don't, if we see that we're gonna have a human resource crunch, we will just have that department hire the vendor. But we don't charge in general if it's a general pool room. That just comes out of our budget. If it's departmental, absolutely. And we, again, we tell them, here's, here's why I want you to buy a Panasonic 300. If you buy this, it's cheap, it's gonna last you a long time. We can put it on GVE if you get an MLC 104. We will help you support this product. If you just go down to Fry's and buy some projector there because it was cool and because you like it, if that lamp goes out, I can't help you. You know, if your remote goes wonky, I can't help you, so. But if the classes go into production, like uh, we've got Eric on camera over there. Right? Yeah. Oh, you mean for like video production services? Yeah, yeah. And that's where we've struggled because you're gonna, you know, Doug talks about Echo 360 and some of these recording and streaming processes. We're trying to get more of that automated and we're trying to get people to get back into that. And again, in this fiscal reality that we're all living in now, our departments are all screaming, we don't have money for that anymore. Engineering used to pretty much schedule all their classes over in the distance learning center um, and they're, they're cutting back on some of that. But general pool, we don't charge anything for those. Okay. So, yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it works for us. And it, it also, we try to encourage departments, frankly, to keep as many rooms general pool as we can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the school vice presidents support us in that, too. They really go to bat for us when there's fights over, over spaces. We just gained eight more classrooms 
they came online this term because the Office of Finance Administration said these don't belong in departmental control. They need to be in the general pool to benefit everyone. So, but then we had to find the money to, to get them all technology enhanced correctly. Anything else? Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.